So for WASM time, security begins with a safe implementation language. Uh, WASM time is implemented in Rust. Uh, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla have each independently found that about 70% of the security bugs in their web browsers historically uh, were memory safety bugs. Um, these are things like use after freeze and out of bounds heap accesses. Um, and it turns out that this is exactly the class of bugs that Rust helps us avoid. Uh, and there's lots of languages that don't kind of suffer from those problems, but what's unique about Rust is that it also gives us the low level control that we need to efficiently implement a language runtime. Um, so large portions of WASM time even have zero unsafe blocks, um, such as our WebAssembly binary parser, which is the first component to process potentially malicious input. Um, and the parts of WASM time that do use unsafe out of necessity to implement primitives uh, are carefully vetted, um, both the implementation and the interface to make sure that you can't use them wrong. Um, but of course, Rust doesn't prevent every single bug. It doesn't save us from a miscompilation due to a logic error in the compiler uh, that could ultimately lead to a WASM sandbox escape. Um, so we're gonna discuss the techniques that we use to address those sorts of bugs a little bit later on. Um, but first I wanted to point out that the benefits of a safe implementation language actually extend to applications that are embedding WASM time as well. It's not just kind of only for the WASM time developers. Um, because even a correct WebAssembly runtime's value is kind of weakened if the interface to that runtime is unsafe or it's so clunky that it pushes embedders towards unsafe code out of convenience or to meet performance goals because the safe APIs are kind of too slow and involve too many checks. Um, so that's why we designed WASM Time's user-facing API such that misusing it is nearly impossible. Um, it doesn't require any unsafe rust, uh, but at the same time, the safety doesn't sacrifice performance. Um, so this example is our typed function API and how it kind of leverages Rust type system to do one type check up front. You kind of start by grabbing an untyped uh, you know, function from the instance, and then you do a single type check to kind of convert that into a typed function, uh, which you can then call any number of times and enter you know, WASM through that function with zero more uh, type checks or overhead, right? Um, so our strongly typed APIs let us, the WASM time developers, kind of maintain the critical safety invariance for you, the people embedding WASM time. Um, and this both avoids any kind of potential for misuse uh, and also the overhead of things like repeated dynamic checks. So malicious dependencies are becoming more common. This is when an attacker gains control over a library that your application depends on, say for unit testing, uh, and they add code to kind of search the file system to steal SSH keys, and then the next time you upgrade your dependencies and run tests, uh, your world falls apart. Uh, we cannot let WASM time, and by extension, any application that embeds WASM time be compromised by malicious third-party dependencies. Um, and so it's worth pointing out that WASM itself can help prevent against these kinds of attacks. Um, the component model and WASI, which have been a ton of talks at the conference about, um, give us capabilities-based security and lightweight isolation between uh, software components. And this means that you can put untrusted dependencies into their own sandbox separate from the rest of your application, and you can kind of limit the blast radius of how much damage they can do. Um, but unfortunately, this can't really be a solution for WASM time itself, since WASM time needs to implement that sandbox and is kind of sitting below that abstraction level. Um, so to secure WASM time against malicious dependencies, we use this tool called CargoVet. This was a tool created by Mozilla to mechanically ensure that every uh, third party library used in Firefox uh, has been vetted and manually reviewed by a trusted auditor. Uh, and when performing an audit, reviewers double check the use of unsafe, that potentially malicious user supplied data is kind of handled with care and you're not you know, blindly recurring recursioning, recurring over um, user input that could let an attacker craft an input to you know, trigger you to blow the stack. Um, things like that a markdown parsing library doesn't try to access the file system or network when really it should have no business with either of those things. Uh, and that using the crate otherwise just won't open the door to security vulnerabilities in production. Um, so uh, in the WASM time project, we use CargoVet to require that a trusted WASM time maintainer manu manually reviews all new dependencies and all updates to existing dependencies. 
And then at the same time, we're slowly burning down the list of yet to be reviewed uh, libraries that Wasm time already depended upon before we kind of introduced CargoVet. Uh, and what's cool about CargoVet is that it actually benefits from network effects. So it allows uh, one project to import audits from another project. And so the more trustworthy organizations that start using CargoVet and auditing their dependencies, then the fewer audits we, the Wasm time project, will have to perform ourselves. Uh, and kind of conversely, uh, the more organizations that trust our audits, then the more value each one of the audits that we do provides to the larger community. Uh, so right now, WasmTime imports and trusts Firefox's audits. Uh, Firefox imports and trusts our audits. Uh, Google Chrome and Fuchsia are also publishing audits. Uh, and so the bigger the CargoVet community gets, the better we all uh, benefit. Um, but the security of applications that are using WasmTime isn't just determined by WasmTime's development process. It's also determined by how WasmTime can help unlock more secure application designs that might not have been considered before, say, because the performance overhead made it impractical. Um, and so one example of this is what I call kind of the disposable instance paradigm. Um, I talked a little bit about this in my 2021 WebAssembly Summit talk um, and all of the work that we'd put into making instantiation really fast at that time. Uh, but I'm happy to say that we're even faster now. So you can see that it takes just really a handful of microseconds to instantiate a new uh, WebAssembly module, even when it has a full JavaScript engine inside of that WebAssembly module. Um, and so this is really fast enough that you can create a fresh instance per task, right? And then when that task is completed, you can throw away that task and then create a new uh, instance for the next task. And so this gives you... Um, the ability to do things like instantiate a fresh WebAssembly module for every HTTP request coming in for your serverless application, for example. Um, and it provides um, what I kind of call temporal isolation between tasks. Um, and so this means that a bug that's triggered maybe in one request to the HTTP uh, server uh, can't persist and keep messing up with all subsequent requests that come after that. Um, and so this is something that wouldn't be possible or at least wouldn't be practical without all of the work we've put into making instantiation super fast. So fuzzing is a software testing technique where we find security and correctness issues by feeding pseudo-random data as input into the system that we're testing. Um, we, the Wasm Time Project, we love fuzzing. We do continuous fuzzing in the background 24-7. We do targeted fuzzing when we're developing new features. Uh, we kind of fuzz in the large in terms of, you know, fuzzing all of Wasm Time, but also in the small, um, like fuzzing a particular, you know, WebAssembly text format parser. Um, and at the same time, we contribute to and maintain some of the core fuzzing infrastructure uh, that's used by the whole Rust ecosystem. And I would really say that our pervasive use of fuzzing is probably the biggest single contributing factor to WASM Times code quality. Um, we fuzz because writing tests by hand while necessary is not enough. Uh, we are fallible human beings, and so we're inevitably going to miss edge cases. Um, our minds are not twisted enough to come up with the kinds of inputs that a fuzzer is going to find when you give it enough time. Um, and so fuzzing can be relatively simple, um, you know, like this, where we take random bytes and we throw it at a WebAssembly binary parser and we see if it crashes, right? And we do this kind of simple fuzzing. Uh, but we also do more complex fuzzing and it can get as complex as you want, right? Um, so we generate arbitrary pseudo-random guaranteed valid WASM modules, which is a whole task in itself. Uh, and then we compile those WebAssembly modules both with optimizations and without optimizations. And then we assert that running both of them yields the same result either way. Uh, because any optimizations we perform need to be semantically transparent. If an optimization is changing the result of your computation, that's like a big problem, right? Um, and so this is called differential fuzzing. And uh, in addition to differentially fuzzing against ourselves, we also differential, differentially fuzz against other WASM engines. Um, so we differential fuzz against a formally verified version of the spec interpreter. Uh, we do it against V8, the WASM engine inside Chrome. And we do it against the WASM-I interpreter as well. 
Um, these are the tools um, which our fuzzing infrastructure is primarily built upon. Uh, we use libfuzzer, which is a coverage-guided fuzzing engine that's developed as part of the LLVM project. Um, our fuzzers run 24-7 as part of the OSS fuzz project. And then there are a variety of uh, Rust tools that we kind of help maintain, such as the cargo fuzz tool that kind of orchestrates building and running fuzzers, the arbitrary crate, which lets you um, build structured inputs for your fuzz targets, and the libfuzzer syscrate, which provides the Rust bindings to libfuzzer. Um, so when you're creating a fuzz target, you're kind of pairing together uh, generators and oracles. And so a generator is the thing that creates new pseudo-random test cases. Uh, and this could be, you know, a no-op, where you just take raw bytes from the fuzzer and then you pass them along uh, to the system under test. Uh, but typically for us, we have an implementation of the arbitrary trait. And so what this is doing is it's actually kind of interpreting the raw bytes from the fuzzer and it's turning those into structured inputs that, you know, actually mean something to us, like a guaranteed valid WebAssembly module. Um, and then on the flip side, oracles are the things that take those generated test cases and they check security and correctness properties uh, and evaluate them in WASM time. Um, so this is kind of like the bit of code that runs a WASM test case in both WASM time and V8 and it compares the results. Um, so we have uh, a variety of generators, but the one we use the most is WASM Smith. And this is the thing that produces the random WebAssembly modules that are guaranteed valid. Um, and this helps us test deeper into WASM time and crane lift because we're not gonna bounce off the parser due to a malformed memory definition. Uh, and we're not gonna fail the validator because of a type error inside a function body where we expected an I32 but got an F64 or something like that. So this means we really uh, get through, we go into the compiler and all the optimization passes and we can ultimately run the results of it. Um, so we have configuration options to avoid generating code that's gonna trap at runtime, uh, to only generate certain kinds of instructions such as only numeric instructions or only control flow instructions, things like that, uh, or to turn various WebAssembly proposals on or off. Uh, and so you might wonder like how do we decide how to configure the test case generator? And we throw fuzzing at that as well. We, we do this thing called swarm testing where we tell the fuzzer to generate uh, the configuration itself, and then we use that configuration to generate the WebAssembly module, and this ultimately improves the diversity of our generated test cases because we end up generating even weirder stuff. Um, and I'm happy to say that Firefox has also started using uh, WasmSmith to exercise its WebAssembly engine, so it's great when you know we can kind of all get better together. Um, so. We use, we use a lot of generators uh, for our fuzzing, but we also use a lot of different oracles. Um, they can be really simple, like did the program crash or did it fail in assertion? Uh, we run our fuzzers with uh, various sanitizers. So we can ask uh, address sanitizer if we saw a use after free bug. Uh, you know, did we capture, uh, if we capture the WebAssembly stack, do we see all of the expected stack frames? Um, you know, do we see the expected number of garbage collector managed allocations and deallocations? Uh, is there an unexpected leak? Uh, can we take a WebAssembly binary, translate it to the text format, and then translate that text format back to a WebAssembly binary? And is it the same WebAssembly binary that was the original one? Because it really should be. Um, and there's many more. Um, we even have a symbolic checker for register allocation that we use as an oracle for fuzzing. And so uh, register allocation kind of goes from when you have um, you know, a bunch of instructions that use an unbounded number of virtual registers to kind of an equivalent program that uses a fixed number of physical registers that the machine actually has. Uh, and so what the checker does is it takes both of those versions of the program and it proves that the uh, version with the bounded number of physical registers actually implements the same program as the one that had an unlimited number of virtual registers. And so when we're fuzzing, what we do is we'll actually generate arbitrary control flow graphs of basic blocks that contain instructions that operate on virtual registers. Then we run the register allocator, and so we get an equivalent program that uses the fixed number of physical registers. And then we use this checker as an oracle to assert that the register allocator did its job correctly. And so we just do that in a loop and um, yeah. Um, so 
when we implement new features in WASM time, we write generators and oracles that are specifically designed to exercise those new features. And that register allocation checker was one example as it was developed alongside a new register allocator for CraneLeft. Uh, but when, when we're implementing new WebAssembly proposals in WASM time, um, kind of the baseline for considering that WebAssembly proposal implemented and done is to add support for that proposal to WASM Smith so that we can uh, fuzz with that. Uh, but we'll also create generators for testing more specific things. Like when we were implementing the uh, WebAssembly reference type proposal, we started emitting uh, inline garbage collector write barriers in our code. And so we generated, we created new generators specifically for exercising those things and really hammering on those operations. And that found a bunch of bugs, you know, before they went to production, right? Um, we also developed a fuzzer for the component models interface functions before, um, or as in concert with their implementation in WASM time. Uh, so you could really say we've fully embraced fuzz-driven development. Um, but at the end of the day, fuzzing just gives us a statistical claim that the program is correct with respect to what the fuzzer has exercised so far. Right? And the, the longer we run the fuzzer and the more inputs we feed to it, the closer that claim will get to 100%. But it's never quite going to reach 100% because the input space is way too large or even infinite. And so we'll never exhaustively enumerate every input and be able to say that it's correct for everything. Um, and so that's where our, form, our efforts to formally verify parts of WASM time and crane lift come in. Um, the VeroWASM project uh, was a collaboration between UCSD, Stanford, and Fastly, uh, and it's a translation validator for WebAssembly programs that are compiled with CraneLift. Um, it proves that for a particular program that was compiled with CraneLift, uh, that program's control flow and its memory accesses cannot escape its isolated sandbox. Uh, and so this is not a claim about like the handful of inputs we happen to run on this program. This is actually a proof that every single input that could be given to this program stays within the sandbox. So it's a super strong claim um, and it's, it's great to have. Uh, so VeroWASM was developed for an older version of CraneLift and we're currently in the process of kind of rewriting it and extending it to work with all the kinds of WASM memory configurations that WASM time currently supports now. Um, uh, we're also verifying our instruction selection. So instruction selection is the phase within the compiler where we go from kind of this high level uh, target independent form, which we call Cliff in CraneLift's case, and we lower that to a architecture specific form, which we call VCode. Uh, and this is kind of in the pipeline after we've run all the common target independent optimizations like global value numbering and loop invariant code motion, uh, but it's before we do things like register allocation. And so this is really when we're choosing exactly which machine instructions we're gonna emit. Um, when we're doing instruction selection in CraneLift, we use this DSL called Aisle, and we designed Aisle with an eye towards verification from the start. Uh, but first, here's an example. Um, so this is taking an iAd cliff instruction, and it's mapping it to an ARCH64 add instruction. Uh, and so in this case, it's really simple. They're one-to-one. -one. Um, but there are a ton of different special cases when we're doing instruction selection. And each one doesn't really matter a ton, but ultimately they come together and they really add up, and it makes a big difference. Um, so for example, if one of our operands is a constant, we might be able to fit that constant into the add instruction itself. Uh, and this saves us code size, it lowers register pressure, and ultimately it leads to better optimized programs. But we can only do this with certain constants. They have to fit into this special 12-bit encoding that's uh, specified uh, by the ARCH64 instruction set. Um, and so, Though all of those constraints are what this top rule is describing. It's saying, if we match an iAd, where one of those operands is a constant, and if we can fit that constant into the special 12-bit encoding, then we can use the special ARCH64 add instruction that contains a constant 12-bit operand. The bottom rule is kind of the same thing, but for when we can turn an addition with a constant operand into a subtraction with the negated version of that operand, but it can fit into the 12-bit uh, encoding. Um, and so there are tons and tons of rules like this, uh, but they get much more complicated than this even. Uh, and the problem is, 
regardless of how complicated they are, getting any of them subtly wrong could lead to a security vulnerability. So it's really important that we get these correct. And so as I mentioned, luckily we designed our DSL with an eye towards verification from the start. Um, so we have an ongoing collaboration to formally verify the correctness of our instruction selection. Uh, this is proving that the machine instructions that we emit do in fact actually implement the original target independent cliff uh, that we were given. And this is true for all values that they could be given. Uh, it's, it's a proof again. Um, and so if we write a buggy rule, then the verifier will uh, tell us it's incorrect by giving us a counter example. So this is an input where uh, for the original cliff, it evaluates to one value. And then for the lowered machine instructions, that input evaluates to a different value. And so the counterexample and its divergent results make it really easy for us to kind of diagnose and fix the buggy rule. Um, so I'm happy to say that this work has been conditionally accepted for ASPLOS 2024. Uh, at the same time, we've also refactored CraneLift's uh, middle end peephole optimizations to use uh, the same IL DSL and to be expressed as rewrite rules. So these are all the classic kind of target independent optimizations like x plus zero can be rewritten to x. x times one can also be rewritten to x. Uh, or what we have here, kind of x times two can be rewritten to x left shift one, uh, although this is the generic form that works for any power of two. Um, so rewriting these optimizations into IL lets us formally verify the correctness of these rewrite rules. And so we can further shrink the amount of unverified code we have in our uh, code base. And we intend to basically keep applying this sort of process to the whole compiler pipeline and really pushing it as far as we can. So Spectre is a class of attacks exploiting speculative execution in modern processors. Speculative execution is when the processor kind of guesses where control is going to flow, even though it hasn't actually computed branch uh, conditions or indirect jump targets yet. And it starts tentatively executing its guess. And when the processor guesses correctly, the speculation's execution's results are used, and this gives you a massive speed up to the program. Uh, but when it guesses incorrectly, it kind of has to discard that whole speculation. Uh, unfortunately, even discarded speculations can still affect the contents of caches and other internal process state. And so an attacker can indirectly observe these effects by measuring the time it takes to perform operations that access that same internal state. And so under the right conditions, when the stars align, this allows the attacker to kind of deduce what happened in the discarded speculative execution and effectively kind of see past um, bounds checks and other software implemented security measures. Um, so it can be tempting to try and do things like add OS process boundaries between everything. Uh, this is a common mitigation. But one of WebAssembly's most enticing features is that we can make its sandbox isolation super lightweight, lighter weight than an OS process. Um, and as we talked about earlier, that actually unlocks further security benefits like the disposable instances and isolation between task, tasks. Um, or you might be tempted to think like, hey, attackers need to have access to a timer to pull off a, a Spectre attack. Can we simply remove timers? Uh, but it's surprisingly easy to find widgets that can be turned into timers, actually. There's this really cool paper called Fantastic Timers and Where to Find Them uh, that shows that really kind of seemingly completely benign APIs can be turned into timers, actually. Um, so you know, but kind of before going too much further, I want to highlight that the nature and severity of Spectre vulnerabilities is going to depend greatly on context. And so these mitigations that we're going to talk about can form part of your overall protection, but it's something you should really be thinking about kind of holistically. So uh, WASMTime implements a number of Spectre mitigations to prevent speculative execution from leaking information to malicious programs. Um, so we bound the bounds checks for tables and the call indirect, in, indirect instruction uh, have mitigations to basically prevent a call indirect from calling an arbitrary location in the process uh, under speculation. The Burr table instruction is protected from speculative attack, which ensures that it can't transfer control to arbitrary places in the process uh, under speculation. 
Um, and by default, WASM Time's configuration for memories is going to use uh, virtual memory guard pages to elide bounce checks for memories. But you can disable this if you don't want to use that. And then in that case, we have to emit explicit bounds checks for every memory access. Uh, and so when we do that, then we also emit code that uh, mitigates against Spectre and prevents uh, WASM memory accesses from escaping the WASM linear memory. Uh, and finally, we're also implementing support for hardware control flow integrity features, uh, which can also help mitigate Spectre attacks. Um, such as the BTI extension for ARCH64. Um, so security researchers keep discovering new Spectre attacks and inventing better mitigations for them. Uh, so this is sort of an evolving space, and we're going to keep expanding and refining WASM time Spectre mitigations in the future as well. So even with all the things that we've discussed, all of our safeguards to catch bugs before they're written and before they ship to production, um, the reality is that bugs can still slip through, um, no matter what you do. Uh, so we have backup contingencies. Um, it begins with our published guidelines for reporting security bugs uh, and our published disclosure policy. And when we do get a report of a security bug, uh, we know that handling it is a very delicate matter and we don't want to make mistakes. Uh, so we have a vulnerability response runbook um, authored by Pat over here. Thank you, Pat. Uh, that we use to actually walk ourselves through responding sec to security bugs in the moment. So we can make sure to like check boxes one by one. Uh, and then once a patch is written, we backport the security fix to the two most recent WASM time releases as per our, our documented release process. And you know, I, I could just say all these things, but um, I want to tell you that these aren't just words and hollow promises. Um, we've exercised these safety nets before and flexed these muscles uh, when faced with uh, security bugs like crane lift miscompilations and incomplete stack maps for garbage collection in the past. So I've talked about how we bolster WASM time security posture and the security postures of applications embedding WASM time or running in WASM time with things like language safety, fine-grained isolation, dependency auditing, ubiquitous fuzzing, 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 uh, and formal verification. And we believe that these are really the minimum practices that you must demand from any WebAssembly runtime when you're running untrusted or security sensitive code. Um, we're constantly trying to raise this bar and further strengthen WASM time's security and correctness assurances. And you don't have to use WASM time, but you do have to make sure that whatever runtime you are using is doing these same things if you're running untrusted code. Uh, and if you find that a runtime isn't obsessively fuzzed, for example, do not use it for these purposes. Um, only use WASM runtimes that have these security practices. Thank you.